And, uh, and just remember, every time it rains, that's the Lord reminding you that you need more saturation, way more than you think you do. Okay? We discussed that. All right, Romans 8. <clears throat> Romans 8. Glorious turn now as we begin to head into the meaning, the, the intended goal, the intended purpose of God where he gets us past sin and sin nature and he starts moving us toward his nature. And so we're going to just read some of this. We're going to read uh, Romans 8, starting with verse 1, and we'll go down all the way to verse 17. <clears throat> there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in union in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That, with the purpose of the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. None of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or give life to your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. All right, so <clears throat> this begins, this begins the return. This begins the return of the scapegoat that was let loose in the wilderness that we've discussed quite a bit, even though there in the original scriptures it does not mention the return we found out in the captivity that there is a return there was always meant to be a turn a return in god's heart but not just a return to be what you were before and that's the key israel was not in the land of egypt in the temple in the service of god and and out of whack with god he was, he, Judah was sent into captivity, but not to come back the same way they were. No, not at all. But to find God's return, to find God's restoration, to find God. And that's what the prophets, all the prophets, all of the prophets addressed. It's amazing how much the captivity of Judah is throughout the Old Testament. It's not just in one little portion where they went into captivity. The prophets, pretty much most of them, this is, this is their subject, and they are speaking of a return. All of them bring that up. And that return is going to be to something that they have not been heretofore, and that's important. Now, in our little Christian minds, 
to be carnally minded is death. But anyway, our little Christian mind is <laughs> that what it is is that we're going to come back and the, and, and the return is that we're going to get saved, that we're going we're gonna to experience Christian salvation um, and we're not going to go to hell. Now, you know, just so, just so you know, I don't, hell really isn't mentioned a lot in the Old Testament and in the prophets. They don't. They don't talk a lot about it. And in the, and in the Gospels, there's a certain amount, but in the epistles, there's not a whole lot of, well, you know, you, you know if you don't get right, you're going to go to hell. All that we read, hell's never mentioned. Devil's never mentioned. But there's a problem. Anybody notice what we read? There's <laughs> a problem. And God's dealing with it now because verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in union with Christ Jesus, but it's no condemnation not to anybody that's saved, but to those that are in union, which is salvation. But in union is... No condemnation only for those who walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. All right. Now, I remember when I was in Bible school and I would read that and i go, well, what's the point then? Because I know I'm going to walk in the flesh and this is not fair and, 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 and there's no hope for me and all these, you know, the straight-laced, tie-wearing, you know, other Bible school students, they're going to, you know, because they look spiritual and I definitely didn't look spiritual. Well, it depends on what you, I look, I look more like this. Not the lamb, the guy with the, guy with the hair. I actually kind of like what I do now, except it's gray. <laughs> mm. I guess. Wow. Okay. Just never hit me like that before. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> but what you have to hear is that, um, that Judah is returning, that, that what God planned is starting to become to come back to what was in his heart with Romans 8. And it is starting the process of now explaining another land, another reality, another, uh, not the land that they were in when they were kicked out. And here's what I mean by that. Um, they never saw it for what it was. So they never lived according to it. Does that make sense? They, they, they served God, but they didn't, you know, they, you know, they went through all of the motions. And I'll tell you right now, most of this walking in the flesh and everything, this is pretty much talking about following the law or, more importantly, trying to serve God based on what you do or, or your perceptions of, man, I didn't know I was going to be sharing this tonight, <laughs> or your perceptions of what, you, what pleases God. You know, oh God, you you want that? Let me do that for you. You know, you know, I've, and it's been a long time, but I've been around people that would do that kind of stuff. You know, they go, oh, what what do you need? You know, do you need? You know, and after a while, you're just going, would you just go away? You know, it's like you're you're bugging me with stuff I don't need more than you're doing what I need, because you're trying so hard to please me that you don't have a clue what pleases me. Okay. So, so the, the, and you'll see it. If you, you know what, if you just read Romans 8 real carefully, you will see this, this interchange between the usage of the word flesh and how it's connected with the law, just in the 17 scriptures that we just read here, okay? So, so that, that voids out the fact that there's people who are in Christ and they're saved, and there's people outside of Christ and they're in the flesh. And if you're outside of Christ in the flesh, it doesn't say that. It says there's the, therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ who walk after, don't walk after the flesh but after the spirit. Both of those are in, in union with Christ, but one of them is not walking according to the Christ they're in. They're walking according to the teachings or the, the mean, again, the means that they think is going to please him you know, it just occurs to me that the best way to know what pleases somebody is to find out. <laughs> you know, and I mean, spend time with it, like spend time with the Lord. I mean, and not just, uh, well, Lord, you know, I got this prayer request and I got this and I want this and touch me, help me and do this and do that and it all being right here. You know, 
And basically that kind of relationship, you're not knowing him at all, but he's learning you in the flesh, specifically. <laughs> specifically your fleshly things, you know? Uh, oh, Lord, I don't like this, and would you deal with them, and I don't like that person. Could you just, you know, kill them and send them away or whatever, you know? <laughs> and he's, he's sitting there going, man, this is kind of like what I was experiencing tonight. Anyway, uh, and it is just an agony to his soul because he didn't bring Judah back to be the same old Judah. Now, if you've read Nehemiah and Ezra and those guys, you know that a whole bunch of them were. But thank God there were a few like, like Nehemiah and Ezra. <laughs> that's, why they, that's why they got a book named after them. <laughs> um, who really, I mean, look at how they weep before the Lord in their prayers and the way that, and they, you know what? They take all of the sin of Israel on themselves. Well, that's Christ. They do. They don't go, Lord, help those people. You know, we're the only ones, you know. Um, who was it? Elijah tried that. God said, you, you ain't the only ones. I got thousands. He's going, well, where are they? Well, that's the problem. We, we're so busy with our life, we don't know where they are. <clears throat> All right, so... Judah here, there is therefore now no condemnation. Judah is being brought back to what was always in God's heart concerning a self-giving lifestyle by oneness with Christ. What was always in his heart was that he would have that which is after his kind, not just that which is, you know, Folks, if he wanted people to do everything he wants, he had that. Angels did that. If he wanted that which was just totally sinless, angels were sinless, why mess with us? I mean, I've asked myself that. I'm, I'm going, you know, dude, you got them right there. They do everything you want. They do your bidding, you know, you know which is the way, you know, at that time, that's the way I was hearing all the teaching was, you know, just serve God and don't sin. And, you know, and I'm going, <laughs> You need angels then, and you got them. Just kill us, you know, wipe us out, and live happily ever after with the angels, you know. Hey, now, you know, and they come over there and do exactly what he wants. But that's not what he's looking for. And see, and, you know, what is man that thou art mindful of it? I can't figure it out. I mean, angels are way better than us and this and that and that. Oh, he put something. He, there's several things. Number one, he put a heart in us, a heart that could pursue him on a heart basis. Isn't that right? A heart basis. Now, now we, he also put a head in us, and we can pursue him according to our head. But a heart basis, and then, you know, I've taught it many times, and I've, I've heard people's response, especially Bible school students' response afterwards. I would say, God gave us free will, and God wants you to have free will. And I have heard it so many times afterwards. Praise God. Well, I'm not going to do what I'm supposed to because i got free will. I've heard that. And I, I, I said, God didn't give you free will so that you, he gave you free will so that you would want to do, you would want to be with him. That's really what it was about. But we go, oh, he gave us free will so we can just be free. And so wrong. So, such a perversion of his heart. Again, his heart and why he did what he did. He would, he would rather we choose him. Does that make sense? Not just choose him as Savior. Hosea, isn't that the book of Hosea and so many other books, actually? Not just that we, that we would choose him as Savior. Oh, save me from sin. Oh, thank you. And, you know, I will praise you with my hands lifted up in a worshipful, religious manner. <laughs> He's kind of going, hey, 
How about bringing them hands over here and throwing them around me? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like Mary at his feet and wipe, you know, that's a whole different thing. I was talking to someone recently and I said, okay, let's, let's compare. Let's put a big screen up here and let's put a person, he's a Christian. And let's compare his relating to this other one who is a bride. And let's say, let's figure out the difference between serving, what they, what, how they would um, define serving. Amen? And how they would define seeking the Lord. Look at the Song of Solomon. She jumps up. She's running around town. She's, it's nighttime. They, they're calling her a harlot. They think that all of this stuff's going on. She doesn't care. I just want to find, I have to find him. We say, as a Christian now, seek the Lord. Yes, I can see him standing up there saying, you need to get into your Bible and you need to do this and that and that. And, you know, and it's all... This, again, the same exact things that a, a Buddhist would do or a Muslim or somebody else. Find a building, go to it. Find a book, read it. Pray a prayer. All of them do it. What's the difference? And they all do it in a religious manner. But he's calling our hearts unto him. So to return without that is not to return at all. I don't care. Right? Yeah. It's not to return at all. There is no return with that. And if he's looking for that which is after his kind, then what I ask is he looking for? He's looking for selfless giving because he has been that to us over and over and always. He's looking for us to take upon his nature. Guess what? That's what we just read. Whether you've recognized it or not, that's what we just read. That's what we just read. And that's what we're going to encounter literally all the way through to the end. All right, so, so, so listen to this. There is therefore now no condemnation what is that? What kind of turn is that out of Romans 7 that there was all this kind of and Romans 6 where you had to be put to death and Romans 5 and all the way through and the, all the way up to 1. What kind of turn is that? There is therefore now no condemnation. It's the return. It's the restoration. It's, the, it's when the high priest appears and we appear with him and in him and he comes out after doing the Day of Atonement and the lamb and the goat sin off and everything else, and he's in there doing the work, and all, this, and all the people are outside waiting for him. This is the great Day of Atonement, and they're waiting for the high priest to step out and say, it's finished, it's done. There's no condemnation anymore. I've done the work. I've settled this. I've settled it with you, and now you are in union with me there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in union with the high priest how do you think we got in the holy of holies in the first place folks we became one with him who was the high priest and he took us in i mean you you try getting in there on your own and you will die why because you're the wrong one no i'm the right one no you're not well i'm i'm precious to the lord uh, well in a certain context I mean, in a certain context. Because if you, consider, if you consider a person who hasn't understood Romans 6 and Romans 7, and they step into Romans 8, they say, there's therefore now no condemnation, but they're living a, a crossless life. They're living a Christless life, Christ in terms of not that they don't not saved or he didn't come into their heart and he stashed somewhere in there. But he's not their life and there hadn't been a death. And so they're presenting to God as righteous that which Jesus died to put to death. And he says, yes, there still is condemnation to those who walk after the flesh, who have not acknowledged the cross, who have not acknowledged oneness, who are still trying to do it on their own. And, they, you know, and you say, well, I have a desire to please God after the inward man, but how to do it, I find not. Well, that's the point. 
It don't, we say, well, you know, I know I'm doing good because I have a desire to please God. <laughs> I have a desire to, to bless God. So did Cain. Right? You know, he said, look, here's an offering. I bring this to you. And he was pretty proud of it. You know how I know? Because when God started acknowledging his little brother, he said, this ain't right. I was serving God. I was good. I worked hard on my offering. I meant well. And this little brat, so he kills him. He kills him, so now I'm the only one you got, Lord. I'm all you got. <laughs> well, I was just going, no, you're not. You're already dead, buddy. You're already dead to me. I wish that you could see the day of atonement fulfilled right here when he steps out and says, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in union with me. I wish you could see the curtains opening and him stepping out and the people go, oh, praise God. It's, it's settled in his heart. And now let's come to his heart. And he said, if you're in union with me, you got nothing to worry about. You, what did Paul say? Grow up into him in all things. Grow up into him who is the head in all things. In all, how many things? All things. No, the religious things. No. No, you have a head. Can I get amen? Yeah. No. But we have a head and title, and we don't have it, we don't hold the head. We don't, we don't um, consult the head. Oh, but Jesus is my head. Well, do you consult him in these things? No, no, only religious things, you know. And so it's this, it's this separation relationship. It is this empty relationship and thought never occurs to us about him in it. Oh, he's happy. <laughs> I mean, really, that's, we, this is, oh, I know Jesus is happy because he's not mad. You know. Well, I understand that in the natural. My stepfather, that's how we knew he was happy when he wasn't mad. I mean, I didn't even know he was a drunk for years till I saw him sober once. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> he can actually be sober? That was, that was wild. Not holding the head. So, so here he is, he steps out and he is, he is the fulfillment of all of this if you are not out there anymore, but you're in here. You see that? It's powerful if you could only, I mean, it would knock you out of your chair if you could really see that this is the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement when the high priest steps out after doing all of that work and says, there's therefore now no condemnation. You're in union with me. But they missed the union with me, didn't they? They missed the union with the high priest and the end result was they had to go around again one more year. And then after that, you miss it again, one more year. This is the end of one more year. If you can see it, if you can grasp it. Wow. You know, I may address this other times, I feel led of the Spirit to address it now. Jesus said at one juncture, he said, the words that I speak unto you are spirit and life. And I read that some months back, and I broke down and cried, and I went, oh, Jesus, my Lord Jesus, my precious Jesus, I read your words all the time, and I don't get anything. 
I am so dull, I believe that it's all spirit and life. And I hear it and just go, yeah, praise God. You know, it's just a fulfillment of the day of atonement. That's good. Yeah, praise God. Spirit and life would, would just blow our minds if we could see this as that, because we would see, we would see this in a different context. We see Romans 8 in a religious context. We see it as salvation has come to us instead of union has come, therefore salvation has come. Remember, anybody remember Romans 5? By one man? Anybody remember that? You see, we're not supposed to forget Romans 5 reading this, or Romans 6, or Romans 7, or Romans 1. Or we're supposed to be taking it all in there, and we're supposed to be able to pick up our Bible. And if we don't, and I've, since then, this is what I've done. I, and I've done it many a time now. Shame on me. But I've done it, and I read something, and I just don't get it. And I, and I just say, I'm so sorry, Lord, because I know that that is spirit and life. And I am that thick and that dull that it's just words. It's just words. It's not changing me. It's not affecting me. It's not, it's not breaking my heart. It's not making me love you more. It's not drawing me to you. It's just stuff I read. And then I say, Holy Spirit, dove, you get me. You get me. You get me. I am not going to stand for this. I will not stand for this anymore. Anymore. I may have done it for years, but I am not going to stand for it. I am going to say, Lord, this is something so precious that I can't even comprehend it. Please, please open my eyes to see Jesus. And so I don't treat it just, I, I don't treat it profane anymore. I don't, I don't treat it like I'm reading a, secular book I I just long to hear his sweet voice in it do you know what I'm saying when I say that spirit excuse me spirit and life spirit and life in his voice where when he speaks the 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 you know John the Baptist said it when you know I'm just baptizing okay I'm just baptizing, and I'm pointing to somebody that's coming. But when he comes, the, it's like the, this crooked road. You know, he's going to grab both ends, and, and it's going to be made straight. And the mountains are going to be brought down, and the hill, you know, and up as the valleys will be brought up. And you, you go, that is a devastatingly wonderful touch from my Jesus. And he can speak the sweetest thing, and it just, you know, it doesn't have to be disaster. When I say devastating, I mean devastating to my carnal mind and my lack of passion and my lack of wanting him at all costs and, and not going to settle, not going to settle. Our lack of, I'm not going to settle anymore. I want you, Lord. I mean it, and I plan on meaning it for the rest of my life. Sorry. <clears throat> so when the high priest appears, we appear with him. Doesn't it say that in Colossians 3, what, 3? When he appears, we shall appear with him. When he who is our life appears, not our soon coming king, not our savior in the sky, when he who is our life finally appears, in other words, when we see him as life, our life, when he who is our life appears, and then I go, I see who I am. I'm one with you. I see you, which explains me if, in oneness. You understand? In oneness, it explains you. But if you try defining you by scripture without spirit and life, what are you going to end up with? You're going to end up with you, a better you, a, a, a more religious you. That's just what we need. God help us. More religious people in the earth to walk around and spout the same old stuff. You say, Randy, you're being too hard on them. I ain't talking about them. I'm talking about us. <laughs> I'm your pastor, so I got a right to say it. <laughs> 
You know, always go there, don't you? No, that's you. See, it's never us. <laughs> but the, the wonderful thing is this. The Lord's heart is moving now for us. Yes. For us. Hallelujah. And he's just as much here as he was Sunday morning yeah. or Sunday night. And we don't have to have an altar call every time. But you have to have an altar every time. Have to, there has to be an altar. There has to be the cross. There has to be, I come to you. You know, Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. And I've, I've explained this before. But that's, you know, that's not somebody standing there and Jesus over here and, and, or a God over here and he takes their hand and he goes, here, I want to introduce you to Jesus. You can't come to the Father but by me. But here, come Come on, little sweet believer. Father, this is Susie. Susie, Father. You know, there you go. You come through the cross. You can't come in. You can't come to the Father by, by, by the cross. You know, all of these cute little visions we have in our head void out the cross. We become enemies of the cross. But the wonderful thing is the cross ultimately is not your enemy it is your best friend because then you are joined you know and let me just say this there's a difference between being joined to Jesus and being attached to him you know I really like Jesus I just feel attached to him you know well it, that's all you and your love right Yes, I have such great love for him. Do you, you know that, do you realize, I want to just say, do you realize God's going to put you through the paces and challenge that love? Just enter into what he has. Just let it flow into you by him. It's precious. Why would you resist that, you know? You know, most of our attachments to the Lord, we're like a, a parasite connected to him. I'm going to suck the stuff out of him. Yeah, I'm going to get what Jesus has got into me while I still live separate from him but attached. <laughs> you know, they, they do stuff. To, they burn those things off, you know. <laughs> so get ready. If that's been your, your union with Christ, We're not getting very far tonight. All right, so he, he appears. The high priest appears, and he says, this is the old covenant, and he goes, it's done. Atonement is made for one more year because I know you people are going to mess up again because you live in the flesh and not in the spirit and you're not attached to him. But anyway, let's glory that has been done. We probably got at least 30 seconds before you sin again and start the whole process all over again, you know? But Jesus comes out and he goes, the new has come, I'm it, and you're one with me. How new is that to you? And all the people go, yeah, yes, that's new, that's real new, that's not improved. I love you, I love you. This is better than we thought. I, I did love you before, and I tried so hard, but I always failed. But now I can love by you, and in you, and from you. Doesn't it say that about Jesus? In him, and to him, and through him are all things, and by him all things consist. And what does that word consist in the Greek? Hold together. Hold together. And say, well, how am I going to stay with Jesus? I'm such a mess. By him. I am. <clears throat> I wrote, there's therefore now no condemnation. Why? Because the high priest finished the work and then showed himself as all things new. All right, so, so there, is this, there is this thing up to verse 17, and this thing is this contrast between flesh and spirit and our our um, definitions or understandings of what the Spirit is there, we well, almost always make it the Holy Spirit. 
And it's hard for us to believe that the Bible would mention any other spirit besides the Holy Spirit because, you, you know, Jesus, don't call yourself the spirit. You're stealing my title. You know, but can you see the Holy Spirit saying that? You know, no, I don't see that. But this, this spirit, well, you know, and it'll tell you. It'll tell you. It'll div it will show you some things when you read through this and just try to find out what he means by walk in the spirit. But, what he, but I'll tell you from just verse 1 what he means. What he means is that if you're in union with him, you walk in his spirit. You don't live outside of him as if you're separate from him. You don't live outside of him as if there's two. You don't live for him because then you're in separate, if you understand what I mean by that. I mean, if you understand that, I mean, I know that you can, but, but in our definitions, in our mind, in our understanding, to live for him makes us something separate from him. He's over there, and I'm going to live for him. And the whole point of that high priest stepping out and, and saying, you know, okay, it's done, all things are new, is so that you don't have to live separate anymore. So that you don't have to to try hard doing things based on what the prescribed method that will please God, which, which was called the law. But for us as Christians, it's anything that we do that's ordered by pleasing and satisfying God that doesn't come from oneness. Okay? So the Spirit of God would be on this to show us the spirit of Christ, and so we'll so we'll see that. So, um, so so it goes through this big deal. You know, those who walk after the flesh, but not after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's not your life. Did you know that? Jesus is your life. The law of spirit of the spirit of life that's in you that comes by union in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned it, so he condemns that in his own flesh and then puts away his own flesh. And now we no longer know him after the flesh. Now we're not following Jesus in the Gospels. Now we're not knowing him after the flesh. And, and uh, uh, you know, and now Paul doesn't spend time talking about any miracle that was in the Gospel. Nor does he talk about any story that was in the Gospel. Nor does he, he talks about this priest that steps out and says, all things are new and I'm it. And we're not going around another year. Woo! Glory to God. You know? So Jesus condemned it in his flesh, put away his flesh, buried his flesh. Now we are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, but not, not as flesh, but as his flesh, meaning his body through which his heart beats through which his hands, his, his desire reaches forth. So that when you reach forth, it's not just you for him, and it's not just you wanting to, to bless him. It is not I, but Christ. Why? Because it says that. You say, well, I don't understand that. Part of it is that you have to start seeing him. If you, don't see, if you don't see him crucified, you're not going to understand any of this. It's just like, well, I don't get that. I mean, the very fact that we'd say, I don't get that, should make us go, oh, God, I don't get that. I don't, you know, I, I've done that. I mean, I just, I just do this. I do this. And I say, look, I don't get that. If that's of you, show it to me. If it's not of you, let's get rid of it. If I've got blockages that, that make it of you, but I can't get it, let's deal with the blockages. 
I mean, I don't, I'm not messing around. I just want the Lord. And I want him, you know. And I don't, you know. And most of the time when you really want the Lord, it means you're going to have to give up you on a lot of levels. Say, so I can't have any fun anymore? Do I ever have fun? Ever. I mean, it's such a sad, lonely life that I never have any fun. You know, there's lots of fun, but it's, but, but it's only going to come to that when you can divide the difference between you in the flesh and him as your life. The, there are things that he put in you. There are everything from talents to all sorts of stuff that he put in you. He's not going to get rid of those. He's going to get rid of the person who uses them for their own glory and flesh. You know, it's, he's not going, oh, I'm really sorry I gave them that talent. No, he said, I'm really sorry that they took that up in their flesh and now they've become famous and, you know, they were singing in church and bringing me glory and now they got a big record contract and now it's gone and then, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Stuff like that. Stuff like that. Where we just take it and we just turn it all for back to us. Anyway. I still need to, I still need to go down this road here just a little bit. Verse 5, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Okay, so what is this flesh and spirit again? Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. He's making a contrast between what is just dead to him and what is life and peace to him. And life and peace to him is there's no more enmity. There's no, you understand en enemy. There's no more enmity. There's no more enemy. There's not my enemy over there and here. I am. <clears throat> it's been put to death, and what's been raised up is that his body, which has been joined to him. It one meaning there's no more enemy because there's no more. There's just one. See, We're, that war starts when you got two, with opposing ideas and concepts. You know, you, you want to get a, in a fight with your spouse? I'll tell you how to do it. Both of you take a side. <laughs> Both of you pick a side and then go at each other. Okay, you want to you know how to finish all that kind of stuff? Become one. You know, don't renew your vows. Become one. Okay, don't, what do they call it when you have this special, you get remarried, not remarried, but whatever. Renew, renew your vows. Renewing your vows. I'm going to, re let's renew our vows. Things will be better. You know they won't. You'll just, by breaking them, you know, the fre we're going to break, we're going to break them fresh, new and fresh, you know. <laughs> you know. Bec become one. One. One mind, one heart, one purpose. And then go after it. Praise God, huh? Okay, so, um, because the carnal mind is enmity, there's your enemy right there. There's you with Jesus and you with your carnal mind. Who are you going to choose? Who are you going to call? Flesh busters. Okay. <clears throat> So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. All right, so this is, this. they that are in the flesh, remember from verse 1, they are in Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ who walk not after the flesh. Those who are in Christ who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If there was, if, if there was only the possibility of just being in Christ and therefore you're just one without, without loving him or his heart or going after him, then you would automatically be in Christ and there would be no flesh. And this verse wouldn't even be necessary. Does that make sense? That there wouldn't even be necessary. But the fact is, we can be in union with Christ and that's where, you know, carnally minded, you see that over in 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3. And, uh, um, 
that it's possible, that you can be babes in Christ, that you can be carnally, you know, carnal and in Christ. Well, what is carnality? Well, act in a certain way and being babies and that. No, it's not knowing the union that got you in there. It's not knowing the one of union. It's not giving yourself to the one of union. It's giving yourself to yourself. So look at verse 9 now. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Okay? What does it mean, the spirit of God? That's the Holy Spirit, right? Um, now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. All right. So here we go. Let's walk down religious lane together in the explanation of this scripture, holding hands and, you know, bowing to what we've been taught instead of what the Holy Spirit teaches. Well, if this is literal, then if I don't have the spirit of Christ, then I'm none of his, so I'm not saved. And that's what it's saying. And it's not saying you're not saved. You're in Christ. But you're none of his. Don't you understand what that means? You're not out from him. You're you. But I'm me for God. You should have seen me before I was in Christ. <laughs> it's still you. <laughs> it's not my son. All those things that you keep laying up on the altar, giving to God, thinking not, not giving to the altar, giving to God, saying, here, take, take this good point about me. Here, take this, you know, Use me, and usually the use me is, you know, if it was a wonderful talent or gift, it's wrapped, and on the inside of it is your flesh going, yeah, use me, you know, use me. And so that he, he goes, I can't. Well, why didn't the Lord use me? I don't know. You figure it out. I mean, that's it. We're always going, why didn't the Lord use, why is the Lord using so-and-so? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe what they're offering up, they're not wrapped in the big middle of it. And I know God will use anybody. He'll use a jackass. I'm not looking at anybody in particular. I'm just, I have to look down when I say stuff like that. People go, he called me. And I didn't mean it. We're not talking about you either, okay? We're talking about, we're talking about the, the very heart of just wanting the Lord. And it really, it really comes down to that. I'm saying all this stuff. It's just, it's just stuff. There is, no, there is no quick fix. There's no book that you can read real quick, even the Bible, and get it. There's only, we can only cultivate a heart that says, Jesus, you know, when the heart turns to the Lord, the veil is rent. Doesn't it say that? And without holiness, you will not see God. And we go, well, what's holiness? The word holiness, it doesn't mean not ever sinning again. Because first of all, I don't know of anybody that's holy then because there's, <laughs> there's none that never sins. Okay, so if it means that, nobody's going to see God. Right? But holiness means being separated unto the Lord. That's the meaning. It is the meaning. All right, so, so is it, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I, make, I throw all this stuff out. Is it possible to sin and to do some terrible things and still end up separated unto the Lord you know, David did a terrible thing, and yet, look at what he did. He turned right around in Psalm 51 and grieved to his core. He didn't say, oh, sin, sin, I hate sin, I can't believe I sinned. No, that was you. 
he said, against thee, thee only have I sinned. And he goes, I, I love you. I don't want separation from you. This is killing me because of you. That's what's going on in his heart. Read it. You can find it. You, but you've got to get past this. Well, and, you know, against thee, thee only, you know. No, no spirit in life. No, no, i got to have that. You know? i got to eat the word instead of just reading it. Looks pretty bad up here now. <laughs> but you are not in the flesh, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you now. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And when it says has not the Spirit of Christ, it means you're not functioning in it. It's not operating in you. You are in Christ, but the Spirit of Christ is not functioning in you. Is Jesus in you? Yes. Is the Spirit of Christ functioning in you? And if you don't see the difference between the Spirit of Christ and the Holy Spirit, about 25 years ago, I did a, I did a tape or a book or something, I don't know, on it. And, and, it, and it's good. I mean, you know, I mean, it helps you to see that, that there really is a difference through, if you go through the Scriptures. Okay, and if Christ be in you, do you notice anything here? Do you notice a trend here that he was talking about being in Christ but still being a mess, and now he's pointing to Christ in you? Anybody notice that? There's been a turn. He admits, you're in, you're in me, and now I need to be in you. Remember that? He said, at that day... There was a glorious day that Jesus was thinking about. He was looking ahead in his mind as he spoke of this. It sure wasn't right there with these 12 disciples while he was talking about it. They sure weren't it. But he says, at that day, you shall know that I am in you and you are in me. Okay, he didn't say you'll know the theology of it. He said, you will know intimately know this and it'll be in you this is the seeds being placed in you and that's bringing forth fruit unto God which is where do we get that from Romans 7 Romans 7 marriage that union and he's saying okay I killed the old man I killed your old husband so that you could be joined to another that's one so that. I did this so that, and I did another so that. I put to death your old husband so that you could be joined to another, so that you could bring forth fruit unto God. Make God a grandfather. Fruit unto God. He didn't say fruit unto himself. And there's different ways of looking at it. But... No, there's no grandchildren in the kingdom of God. You're all born again, da da da. But if, but if you understand the progression that he's talking about, he's wanting that which comes out of you to be his fruit because of his seed. His fruit because of his seed. His fruit because of his seed. Not a continuation of your old husband still having relationships with him and his seed, and you're pumping out other stuff that is contrary to him while you're. Anyway. Sorry. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, meaning the body is not ruled by sin. Okay? It's dead to it. It's dead to it. Because you're alive unto God through Christ. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, okay, now this is not talking about the Holy Spirit, but the Father. Let's see if, let's see if, that, let's see if it pans out. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also give life to your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Anybody see... Anybody want to try to, to separate the threads of this and try to see what it's talking about? Well, I, here's what I believe. I believe 
that the, the father, you know, I'm just telling you what I believe about this scripture. I believe the father is the one who raised him from the dead in this sense because the father raised him, and maybe you don't always see this. Maybe when you hear the words raised him from the dead, you just go, oh, well, Jesus was dead, and some had, somebody had to get him up. The father went in and woke him up. You know, some dumb thing like that. The father raised the lamb from the dead and glorified and exalted this self-giving one to the highest height. That at the name of this one, wherefore, anybody remember that from Philippians class? Okay, we'll do that one again next semester then. Philippians again. <laughs> My God, if you hadn't got that one, I don't know. Plus, I never finished that class. You know that, don't you? Anyway. Um, but if the spirit of him that raised uh, Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised Jesus from the dead is going to raise you, give life to, quicken you by his spirit, the, the, the lamb that died. Well, that's what it says. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's what it's trying to communicate. Well, it is written th that way if you see it. Okay, so, the, so what are we saying? We're saying that the Father raised Jesus from the dead in a sense of exalting this lamb above everyone and put him on the throne and said, that's what I exalt right there. He that humbles himself is exalted. He that exalts himself is humbled. He humbled himself more than anyone. You go on the throne, lamb. And he raised him from the dead. And if he that raised that spirit from the dead is in you, you're going to be, well, let's just read it the way it is. And if the spirit of him, the father, that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised Christ from the dead shall also quicken or give life to your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Christ is being exalted in his body. But not just Christ. Christ crucified. Christ crucified. Because that's what the Father exalts. Okay? Okay. Now, in light of what we've, we're discovering so far, we're, we're on a, an incredible road all of a sudden here, beginning with verse 1. This is not, this is not regular. This is not Romans business as usual. <laughs> this isn't. It is not Romans business as usual. This is the high priest on the day of, uh, of uh, atonement stepping out and saying, I am all things new and you are now one with me and you are in union with me. But then he says, but that union with me as high priest gets you into the holy of holy, gets you into the throne of grace. But what? Ultimately, I did that for was so that my spirit could dwell in you. My spirit, not just the Holy Spirit going, oh, I got the Holy Spirit, you know, and I'm, you know, somebody's looking at me like, you're going to blast from real quick and God is going to strike you with this storm. He's going to speed it up and he's going to get you. But I think blasphemy in the, uh, I'm not going to. I'll leave you, I'll leave you with that so that if you blaspheme, you're on your own. That's a joke, people. But I think blasphemy of the Holy Spirit has to do with his, wor his most holy work. I'll just I'll leave that there. More than there's one particular thing, and you could trip over it at any time. Well, that's kind of the way people look at it. You know. <clears throat> All right, so... Um, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. What is he saying therefore for? What is it there for? That's what I look at therefore for. I always to find out what it's there for. Therefore means there's something that went before it. And what went before it is he said that you're, if you <clears throat> don't have the spirit of Christ, you're not functioning as he is. You may be in union with him. You may have prayed a prayer and got saved. But you're not functioning by the spirit of Christ. <clears throat> and so he says, but you don't have to worry. You're not in the flesh if 
But if the spirit of him, and then he goes on to say, but if the spirit of him that raised, exalted this lamb from the dead dwells in you, he that raised Christ from the dead is also going to give life to you, your mortal body, by the spirit of Christ that he exalts that dwells in you because he's already talked about it two times prior to this just in the two previous verses about his spirit, the spirit of Christ being in you. See, it's a shame that you have to, it's like, but you, have, you know, our minds are so used to just reading things a certain way. We go, okay, this means that and this means that. Therefore, you're a debtor not to live after the flesh. You have the very life of Christ in you. It's not just because you're in union with Christ that everything works. Because it would be like, here's, here's a vine. Here's a big vine. And here's a branch. And he grafts this thing in there. And he hooks it in there. And none of the life of the vine goes into that branch. But it's in union. And it's grafted and tied in to that thing. And he says, I'm in union. And... The man who did the grafting, which the scriptures say it was the father, who was the husbandman, he says, where's the fruit? The fruit of what? The fruit of the vine, the fruit of the life of the vine, the sap. Not, I didn't want you just in the bark. I'm connected to the bark. <laughs> God, you know, I'm grafted in, I'm telling you, I'm holding on tight. You got, but if the spirit of him that dwells in you doesn't dwell in you, you're none of his because you're not going to bring forth any fruit unto God. Okay? So that life of that vine has to get in you. The union is done so that that same spirit that, that, that the father could say, this was mine. This was my plan. I didn't even know we're going over. Good grief. We need to stop. Father, we just thank you. And if this is our last class for tonight, we ask you to bless it and feed us on your bread, not Randy's ranting. And Lord, that your heart, Jesus, that your heart, that we can get past reading dead letter and getting nothing, but we can cry out, that for spirit and life from your word and that we can we can cover our face in shame that we read and yet we never it never comes to us that we're not even seeking you as spirit and life we we claim to be seeking you but we're just looking for the holy spirit to give us a nugget or something lord we need your heart we need your 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 spirit and your life and we ask the holy spirit to open our heart first, and then our eyes, and then fill us, and then use us after. They'll use us his way down the road. We ask it. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can shut down your.